All right. Good morning. Let's give a hand to our worship team. Thank you so much for singing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, my name is Joseph. Um, I come from Gainesville. I met most of you, but just in case, um, came from Gainesville. I have two daughters, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. They're adorable and terrifying at the same time. Um, I've been uh, blessed to be preaching for the last year and a half and helping many churches, um, speaking at my own church and churches in Alachua County, and I'm just so grateful to be here. I work for the Boy Scouts of America as a fundraiser and recruiter for young men and women to join the Scouts. So I serve all the communities from Lake City down to Ocala. So I've been in Bellevue, Denellen, Marion. Uh, I've not been here specifically, but um, I know the area well enough, I could say. So it's interesting to come into a book like Revelation and really not know where everyone stands on different things. And uh, I just want to say from the outset, um, as we joke in our, we don't joke about this, as we say in our preaching team where Richie, who was here last week, and you've seen uh, Bill as well, we talk about being post-trumpet Christians. What does that mean? So Paul, and of course in Revelation, after the seventh trumpet is blown, the kingdom of God comes into the kingdom of the world. And that's our great hope in the end, is that uh, in the end, God kingdom, God's kingdom does come, Jesus comes, and we are resurrected to, to him and to be with him. And that's our hope in the end. And that's where we can all agree um, on the book of Revelation. Um, Last week, just so we're caught up, mostly for me, just so we're all caught up, uh, we talked about the judgment of God in chapter 8 and 9. Lots of judgment passages, and, you know, God's judgment is righteous and true, and still hard to hear, but righteous and true. And we're in this interlude, as we're going to read together, after the sixth trumpet of judgment. We're in this interlude, and this occurred... Um, in chapter 7 as well, where there was the sixth seal that was opened, and the question was asked, who can stand? And in chapter 7, it starts off with a picture of the complete redeemed people of God, uh, the 144,000 and the mass of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And so we have this interlude here right before the seventh judgment again that gives another picture of the church and the redeemed. So we're going to talk about that today. Before we get there, I want to tell you a story that I think you'll enjoy and help understand a little bit of what we're going today. So my daughter joined the Cub Scouts, which is the, the cute little kid's side. She's five years old. And we were selling camp cards. And those are just coupon cards, you know, $5 off, 50 bucks at the local grocery store. And they sell them to raise money to go to camp. And so I told my daughter about that, Riley, and she was excited. And I was like, okay, well, we'll see if that remains. The day comes where we're supposed to be outside of a Publix. We have a little table. We made a sign, bright yellow, so you can't miss it. And we're eating breakfast, and I'm telling her about, hey, we're going to go to Publix. We're going to set this table up. And all of a sudden, she starts crying. Mm. So I did what any parent would do and asked, why are you crying? And she's telling me, I don't know. I don't know. And, I, and I'm thinking, I don't know either. But Riley, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. I'm going to be there the whole time. And the worst thing that will happen is they're going to tell you no. And then we'll just ask the next person. And she's OK, I'll do that. And so the quietest car ride I've ever had with her, she chats about everything. Dad, did you see that? No, kiddo, I'm driving. Do you see that? No, kiddo, still driving. And um, we get to Publix and we set it up. And you can, I can feel the tension off of her. She's very shy and closed in on herself, as you've seen little kids do that before. Um, we set up our table in our bright yellow sign that says, will you help me go to camp? And so we started. And I told her, hey, here's, your, here's what you say to people. Say it loud so they can hear you. Folks, I, I'm honest. The first three people who came up to our table, I don't think my daughter said words. She just whispered, will you help me? So thank goodness for the sign, because that thing is the only reason. They saw this yellow flash over there, and then they saw these beady eyes, because my daughter was hiding behind my leg, as you know children do, and they, she just stuck her head out to the side. 
And so, poor thing. And so she goes, will you help me? And by the grace of God, all these people came up. Oh, we'll so help you. What is this for? And I'm looking at her, and she's like, for camp. I'm like, for camp? Uh-huh. As you know what children do, you guide them through the sentence. I say this, 30 minutes in, folks, you'd think I had a different child. 30 minutes in, she's going, hey, will you help me go to camp? Every single person who walked out of Publix, they had a five-year-old asking for help, asking them for help. And of course, the people that said, no, thank you, and I said, that's okay. I gave her a high five, good job, on to the next one. And she'd go, dad, there's another one coming. I'm like, all right, I'm ready. Hey, will you help me go to camp? This kid got so good at this, okay? This kid got so good at this, one poor lady, I'm, poor her, this lady was walking out, and my daughter goes, hi, will you help me go to camp? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't, I don't have any cash on me. Without skipping a beat, we take credit card. <laughs> and the entire time, my little girl grew up before me in that hour and a half, and she did so good, and I couldn't stop her talking the rest of the day. Um, so I need to go to Publix more often and have her for some quiet time, that's what I learned. But I think that example of being timid and scared and not knowing what to expect when you talk to people, let alone whether you're five or 105, I think that's a real thing for all of us. And in this chapter in Revelation 10 and 11, I think we see some key things from the text about how we are to proclaim the faithfulness of God. So whether we're a five-year-old in faith or a 105-year-old in faith, I think there's some truths here we can share together. And so we can be more of the uh, 40 minutes in kid proclaiming the truthfulness of God and not the whisperer kid. So today we're going to be in chapters 10 and 11. And our main idea is this, how to proclaim the faithfulness of God. And I have a couple points to go with that. The first point is, we have to understand the promise. So in Revelation 10, verses 5 and 7, I'll read to you. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, who does the angel make the promise by? Now, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, my small group's going through 1 Samuel, so David's saying a lot of, as the Lord lives. And what that phrase means is, I make an oath by the Lord who lives. And the the assumption is it lives forever, which is true. The Lord lives forever. But here, we see this angel not only say this, he says, by him who lives forever and ever. Just so you're clear, John, who the angel is speaking to, the one who lives forever and ever. And I'm going to give you a clearer picture. Who created heaven? Who created earth? Who created the sea and everything in it? So, who is the angel making this promise by? God, the creator. I always think of Ohio State, if you're a college football fan, it always says the Ohio State. Well, the creator is what the angel is promising on. The creator of the heavens and earth. And so the angel promises that the mystery of God would be fulfilled. And so the next question we have to ask ourselves, what is that? What do you mean by mystery of God? So, you may have been through the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, we are told that before the foundations of the earth, the Lord chose us to be holy and blameless before Him. So, before the foundations, before the beginning, before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus chose us to be holy and blameless before Him. There's, there's part of the mystery of God. And then next we hear, as we keep reading through the Bible, we see in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Let me read it to you. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, 
Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, hatred, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring. And then he says this, He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Her offspring is moved to a he, to a he. He shall bruise your head. All right, here we have the first ultimate promise that God will be sending someone to defeat the serpent. God will be sending someone who will save Adam and Eve and Eve's offspring from the serpent and from eternal damnation. We, we call this the, um, I'm sure you've heard, the gospel is called the good news. Fancy people use a word like a proto-evangel, which is the, 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 the first version of it, the basic, very basic version of the gospel in Genesis 3. And then as we go along in the Old Testament, we see many different um, things added to this picture. If you want to think of a very blurry picture of who the Savior will be, who the Messiah will be. And then we move on to Abraham, and we are told that Abraham will be the father of all the faithful. That through Abraham, the redeemed will be. And that as countless as the stars or sand on the seashore. And then we move further along and we see David. And then we get told that the Messiah will come out of the line of David. And then we get further along and that he will be crucified and that he will be pierced. And that they will take and cast lots for his clothing. So we get a clearer and clearer picture as we move down the line of Revelation through the Old Testament. Until until there's 400 years of silence and then a baby's born, right? The mystery of God is fulfilled. And he's, part of that mystery is how that you and I can be holy and blameless before God because we are not holy and blameless. Far from it. We are sinners. We, are, we were enemies of God and yet God chose us before the beginning to save you and me. And then so we, the mystery is, how does God do it? How does God then reconcile this world that is plagued by sin and make a new creation? So this whole book, and this angel is saying, by the man who created the heavens, by the God who created the heavens, the earth, and the sea, that the mystery of God will be fulfilled. So we have to understand the promise in order to proclaim the faithfulness of God. What else do we have to know? We have to understand that we are called to proclaim that promise. So, in chapter 10 of Revelation, verses 9 and 11, through 11, So I, the I being John, So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But... When I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. For those who are familiar with the Old Testament, you, this sounds familiar. Ezekiel had a similar thing happen to him. He was told to eat a scroll and then prophesize to the nations, to the nation of Israel specifically. So this has occurred, and it... This, symbolize, this symbol of eating the scroll is two things. It's a commissioning of the prophet, and it could be internalizing the revelation of God. So they were called to eat the scroll. They were called to then share the revelation of God with people, and specifically to a rebellious people. We, too, are called. Now, we are not prophets like John or Ezekiel. All right, we are not sharing new revelation with the people of God. But what we are sharing and what we are called to do is share what God has already told us, what we have in our scriptures, the God-breathed word to share with people. In Matthew chapter 28, what's known as the Great Commission, you've heard this, I'm sure, but he tells us to make disciples, teach them, and baptize them. 
So we've been given this word. We've been given what to say, and we've been called to do it. Individually, we've been called to do it. And I would also say as a church, whether here, Summerfield Locally Church, or the church, all the redeemed in the world, we've also been called to proclaim the faithfulness of God. In chapter 11, we see this, um, we're told about the witnesses, the two witnesses of God. And depending on your viewpoints of um, end times, this changes who that is, and there's lots of stuff going on here. I'd just like to say, as, as in a pastorly role, I think it's important that we focus more on not necessarily who they are, but what they do. And what they do is they proclaim the faithfulness of God. And there's lots of reasons that I think that they could be individuals and a representation of the church. If we know, if we look at uh, verses three and four, the lampstands is a symbol for churches that we learned in all the way back in Revelation one and two. But look, again, their role and what they're being told to do is go out and proclaim the faithfulness of God. So the church has an outward role and an inward role. The inward role of the church here is to love one another, to build each other up in faith and in the love of Christ. But the outward, the outs, outward facing world is to go out and be a light in the darkness, to share the gospel, proclaim what God has done. And to do that until the gospel is spread to all the corners of the earth. The other interesting thing we learned about in Revelation is that there will come a time that the sharing and spreading of the gospel will cease. What do I mean by that? In Revelation 6, verses 9 and 11, I'll read to you so you don't have to flip there. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And when they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until their number of their fellow servants and their brothers could be complete. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. God's gathering his people to him. And we don't have a timeline for what that looks like, but there will be a time where the redeemed have been claimed and the spreading and sharing of the gospel will cease. So we have to understand as people who are, as we proclaim the faithfulness of God, we have to understand that there's a promise and what that is. We have to understand that we individually are called to share and proclaim that promise and as a church, we are called to share and proclaim that promise. And I love the word proclaim. If you're maybe from an older, older generation, my great-grandmother would say herald, herald the gospel. Um, <clears throat> I love that word. But proclaim is a more active role. Proclaiming is sort of putting it there out into the world yourself. Going forth versus Oh, well, if it comes up, I'm going to say it. Proclaiming is, no, we're going we're gonna to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. And like I said, there have been times in my life, I've been that five-year-old girl, you know, beady eyes poking out from some hiding. And there's been times where I've been, we take credit cards kind of deal. So I've been there too. God has promised that he will gather his people and he will save them until their number is complete. So our, our calling, our role, is to proclaim the gospel, proclaim the faithfulness of God until it's time. The next point I want to make sure we understand on how to proclaim the faithfulness of God is understand we will suffer. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 10, and I took the scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, in my stomach was made bitter. Sweet and bitter. Sweet. The, the sweetness of the gospel. The, um, God has saved me who unworthy to be saved. I'm an enemy of God before that, and then he decided to save me and you 
regardless, regardless of what you've done. And definitely not because of your good works in you, because there aren't any in the eyes of God before you're a child of God. I love this verse uh, in chapter uh, Matthew 11. Every time I'm having the worst day, I think about this verse, and I hope it, I wanna, I hope it expands and really pinpoints the sweetness of the gospel. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, how is it easy and light? What is that sweetness? That sweetness is that God has done everything for your salvation. That God has done it all. Of course, its burden is easy and light because all you were told to do is have faith in Jesus. And in scriptures, have we read in Ephesians that that faith is a gift from God. So not only does he do the work for you, he gives you the very thing you need to enjoy his rest. Man, that is sweet. But, but, I love the word but sometimes because usually it comes after a really bad thing, but Christ has saved you. Here, we have the sweet, but there's a bitter part too. Bitter. There's a pain of persecution. And look, I, I don't mean that every single Christian is going to be threatened with their life, but there is a, a range of persecution that all of us will face when we share and proclaim the, the faithfulness of God. Some people do lose their lives. Some people lose their jobs. Some people lose friends. Some people lose communities. Some people use, lose any number of things, a whole scale. But to say that there won't be pain and bitterness when you proclaim the faithfulness of God, that's not what it, the Bible says there will be. It says it will be. There's also the pain of people refusing the gospel. I mean, especially when they're your friends and family, we have tasted the sweetness of the Lord, the rest of the Lord, and all we want is that our family and our friends to be a part of that. And they refuse, and that hurts. That hurts. You're giving them the one thing they need, and they refuse it. There's pain there. There's pain overall as a church, because we know churches will fall, fall in that same category. Whether it's individually, we're talking about persecution and pain of people refusing, but as a church-wide. If we keep reading in Revelation 5, I'm sorry, Revelation 11, verses 5 through 10, if anyone would harm them, them being the witnesses, Fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. What's interesting is when you share the gospel with someone, you're giving them even more clear revelation of who God is. And if they refuse that information, it only heaps further judgment upon them. If anyone would harm them, this is how, they, how he is doomed to be killed. They, the witnesses, have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and that they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some, of, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. Who, those who dwell on earth will rejoice after them and make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. There will be a time where the people on earth think they have defeated God or that there is no God. We've seen this before, though. Think how Satan and his demons and the people who are dead in their flesh and dead in spirit felt when Christ died on the cross. Oh, you thought you were the king of the Jews. Oh, we'll put it up there, but we don't believe you. The celebration of darkness that day. But it wasn't the end of the story. 
That's why I say I love buts. The, the word but. However, therefore. Because we know that three days later, Christ rose. The same thing here. Again, they, they, these people on earth are rejoicing over the bodies of the witnesses. They are sharing presents with them. They are uh, making merry and exchanging. They're probably having house parties and other terrible things. But if we keep reading verses 11 through 19, and we learn this, we learn that though there is suffering, we learn that we will be rewarded and victorious in Christ. Though there will be suffering, we will be rewarded and victorious in Christ. But after the three days, three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And then a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And when they went up to the heaven in a cloud, their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God in heaven. And the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God, then God's temple in heaven was open, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So the resurrection of the saints is guaranteed by the promise keeper. He is the promise maker, and he is the promise keeper. From beginning to the end, our God is in control. From beginning to the end, our God will keep us. From beginning to the end, our God will sanctify us. From the beginning to the end, our God will bless us. From the beginning to the end, our God will sustain us. And from the beginning to the end, our God will raise us in eternal life. So how do we proclaim the faithfulness of God? What do we do from here? First, we live life focused on Jesus. In verse 18, I love verse 18. And I'll read it to you again. The time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants and the prophets and the saints, for those who fear your name, both small and great. I love this verse because there are days I'm having the best Christian day ever. I, the Spirit is strong. I'm feeling good. I'm doing good. I'm having a day. A great day, a day praiseworthy day. But if I was honest with you, I don't know if I have a lot of those days, and I certainly don't have a lot of those days in a row. In this verse of 18, I often find myself in the small category of having fear for the Lord. Maybe you feel that way too some days. Maybe between work stress and the uncertainty of the world, Maybe between trying to be the best spouse you can be, trying to be the best parent you can be, trying to be the best parent to your kids who have kids you can be, from being tired and worn out and afraid and angry, maybe between being stuck in the same sin, maybe you feel unworthy. Brothers and sisters, the truth is, we are unworthy. I am, 
you are. But I will tell you who is worthy. Our King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. It was Jesus who suffered for our sins on the cross. It was Jesus who rose again, defeating death and sin. It, was Je it is Jesus who sits at the right hand of God, intervening for you and me. No matter what day we're having, whether it's the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, what God has done for you can never be taken from you. No matter what your feelings say or your actions, no matter what other people say, what God has done for you cannot be taken from you. That is why our faith is in Jesus and not ourselves. That's why we sing praise to Jesus and not ourselves. Jesus saves us. We didn't. We didn't. So that's why we focus on the work of Christ. We focus on what Jesus has done, because he is perfect in every way, in obedience to the Father. He is faithful. We have faith in him. He is faithful. We have faith in him. So on your bad days or your good days, we stay focused on what Jesus has done and what you're a part of. A second point of proclaiming the faithfulness of God is that we love one another. And this builds off our first point here. When our lives are not focused on ourselves, we're not focused on behaving a certain way to earn salvation, which you can't because it's a gift. When we focus on others and outwardly towards Jesus, we can then care for and love one another. John writes in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. Think about that. We are able to love because we know how terrible of a sinner we are. We know how unworthy we are compared to the holy and righteous God, and yet he still loves us. And yet there is more mercy. So we can love one another. We understand, and if we understand how much grace and mercy we've been given, then we can then give that same grace and mercy to the people around us. We give because God gave us everything. You can love your wife, your husband, your children, your in-laws, because of the love that God has given and continues to give. You can forgive people who've wronged you because you've been forgiven of all the wrongs you've been committing to the Holy Father. You can proclaim the faithfulness of God because while we have been unfaithful, God has been faithful. God is the promise maker and the promise keeper. And the third point when you proclaim the faithfulness of God is to pray. Pray for opportunities and courage to share the gospel, the good news with the people you encounter in your life. And pray that God's will be done in your life and in the world. It was God's will that he chose you before the beginning to save you. It is God's will that will sustain us and keep us. It is God's will that will bring the new heavens and earth. So we proclaim the faithfulness of God because we know who he is and what he's promised. We know what we've been called to proclaim. We know that we will suffer, but in the end, God and us will be victorious. And we know that God is in control. At this time, I believe, invite anyone who wishes to pray with me as we go through our last song together, and then we'll have a, a church prayer to finish us out. Oh. 